Hi, how is everybody? My name is Josh Atwell, and I am a senior technology advocate for Splunk. And in, in my world, I, I talk about and, and talk with people about failure a lot. And I know what you're thinking. This guy's got to be great at a party. Um, because totally if... Rocked well, thank you. Yeah, I enjoy the Ignite Karaoke. Those are fun. Um, in the spirit of Ignite Karaoke, for today's talk, I actually changed the order of my slides. So, this is also an experiment of failure, okay? I think we're going to be fine, though. It's not going to be a problem, all right? Um, but in all seriousness, I do talk to people a lot about failure. And uh, it's part of the work that I do, but part of uh, my desire for, as being a long-time IT operations professional who has dealt with the stresses and the, and the, and the toil associated with dealing with systems and complex systems that fail, um, I think it's really important that we improve the way that we talk about failure. All right, so quick little exercise because I'm the type of person that likes to make people do things. Um, everybody close your eyes for a moment. Please don't go to sleep. Wait till halfway through my talk to fall asleep. All right, close your eyes. It's important that we have trust and safety. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like a failure. I'm the only one that sees. Okay, if you feel comfortable, keep your hands up, just for a moment, if you feel comfortable with other people knowing that you've been a failure or felt like a failure, keep your hand up. If not, put your hand down. And now open your eyes. Okay, two things. Number one, you are not alone. Okay, everybody experiences this. Number two, for those of you who put your hand down, you're also not alone, right? It takes a lot of courage to make that transition and to be open about that. It is hard to publicly talk about failure unless you're presenting on it, right? So this is from uh, Ross Klein. He was just actually talking about this two days ago at the Leadership Summit. Thank you, Ross, for helping um, uh, with this transition in my talk. It is hard for people to talk publicly about failure. The way that we are measured as professionals is around eliminating or avoiding or eradicating failure, right? We are already at a disadvantage in our ability to have a healthy attitude about failure. So let me tell you a story about an almost failure, right? And I gotta be candid, um, it's, it is an almost failure. Uh, early on in my career, or I guess halfway through my IT operations you know, in the data center career, I was involved with a project where we had thousands of ESXi hosts that we had to apply a new uh, certificate on. So we had to apply a new certificate for the virtual center server. And if you know virtualization at all, which I'm guessing about half of you do, when you do that, it breaks all trust communication with all of the hosts, right? And you have to apply that certificate to each host. Well, I'm not gonna do that to thousands of systems by hand, so I wrote automation to do it, right? And for weeks, I prepped I tested the systems to make sure I had the correct root password for the systems, right? You don't want to be surprised by those. Um, and to make sure that once I applied the certificate, I would be able to get it to automatically get reconnected to the virtual center server, right? There's no automatic refresh. You have to re-add it and put it in the right place. We kicked it off 9 in the morning. Seven different virtual center servers, uh, four different data centers around the world, and we sat there and we waited. We waited, and nothing was coming back up. No workloads were going down, but we couldn't manage anything at this point because Virtual Center Server was our management plane. I start to panic a little bit because we had tested it. We had validated that the process works. What is going on? There was one key difference between our testing and this moment, and that was when we were testing, we were using the Virtual Center client. When we were doing the actual work, we were using the web client because of the security certificate change. The web client simply wasn't refreshing, right? It was all working fine. We just didn't know that. But the way that we reacted, we were worried that we had really screwed things up and we were in for a really long weekend, all right? And the thing was is like, I'm not a failure. You know, that, that was not a scenario that labeled me as a failure. I didn't really, you know, take down the world. I just failed at recognizing what was going on and failed at doing something. Uh, Ermin Bobek, she's um, a 
humorist, a cartoonist, a humorist. And uh, if you read about her life, it's very interesting. She stumbled a lot along the way before she became this uh, prominent uh, column, uh, columnist and humorist. Now, when we fail, there's things that happen in our brains. We are chemical beings, right? We're very clever and industrious chemical beings, but we are chemical beings. Um, when things go right and we have success, uh, our body releases endorphins and dopamine and serotonin. And we get a euphoric sense, right? We're, we're excited, we're happy, we're like, I want to do that again. Remember the time that you ride that roller coaster that you were really nervous about, but it's just thrilling? That's what your body's doing. It's releasing all of these chemicals, right? And you are encouraged to repeat that activity, okay? When we fail, however, our body releases cortisol. And what that does is it tells your body to, you know, you get the flight or fight sensation. What it's really telling your body to do is, we're not thinking about any high-level stuff right now. We are just trying to protect ourselves because we feel threatened. And when we fail, we have that feeling. We, those chemicals release through our body, and, and then we have that sensation. Right? I think everyone that raised your hand, that moment of failure is probably very consistent in the way that you failed. Um, and I've also identified in interviewing people, not scientific research, just in interviewing people about their scenarios when they failed and the response. Number one question that I ask people when I interview them is, what was that feeling that you had when you made that critical mistake or you had that fear that you had failed, that you had erred in a way that was going to be impactful? Right? Number one response was, I've let someone down. That's the concern. And, and it was consistent in every interview that I had. Like, no, no me leading them into this. Every single person said the exact same thing. I've let someone down. That is really powerful, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why when, when we fail and our um, discomfort in talking about failure is because it directly ties to the relationships that we have and our feeling of worth and value and how people depend on us. But there's an, an interesting part in the second question, all right? So I'll ask, what was the response to the peop by the people who you felt you were, you were letting down by your mistake or your failure. Every single time, they said, let's get this thing back online, let's figure out what happened, and let's learn from this. Let's, let's try to avoid it happening again, but let's learn from it. In almost every scenario, every person I talked to, this was the response. So it's almost irrational for us to think that that failure is going to be so bad. There's reasons for that. Um, we look at situations and we hear about situations of failure, right? We see it in movies, right? Everything's a disaster. The whole world's falling apart. We hear it in the news. Everything's failing. It's awful. It's bad, right? We're just inundated with this all the time. I love the story of Apollo 13. In Apollo 13, they have a failure on the spacecraft heading to the moon. Three men on there who have no way of getting back safely with the information and the scenario that they're in. Right? Gene Krantz was the uh, flight mission director. Right? He was in charge of the entire mission. And he made this statement, and it's become like a key statement in the history of NASA. He says, failure is not an option, which is a really interesting to, thing to say when you've just had a critical failure. Right? But he wasn't talking about what broke. He was talking about how NASA, everyone at NASA, was going to respond to that to try to bring these men home, alive, okay? Most of us are not dealing with a scenario where you have this level of stakes, okay? So the first thing is, is that when you fail, like, you're not likely dealing with the types of things where people's lives are at risk. And I know some of you do, and I have so much respect for you. I was never able to work in healthcare because I personally could not handle that responsibility. The other part of this is like, we, we hear about it in literature, and we hear the war stories, right? We hear the war stories about these scenarios where people screw up, and they're fired, and their lives are ruined, and, and then they go homeless, and then have problems. I mean, I'm exaggerating, right? That, but that's our, that's our deep fear, okay? 
And so there's this great book called Beyond Blame. I love this book. It's relatively short. Um, I hope you, know, you all have an opportunity to read it, but I'll give you the, the, the Blinkist version, right? A network admin makes just a, a routine, regular change, something he's done multiple times, but everything goes down. And this is a financial institution. This is a problem. Like This means real money, significant monetary impact. Someone has to take the blame. Someone has to be the fall person. They have to be the responsible one, the root cause. We talk a lot about that, right? Turns out it was an unknown bug that had been delivered from uh, the vendor that was on the networking gear that when they executed that command, it broke. It had nothing to do with the person. The person was working well within the system and processes that they had. Yet they were fired. And the book goes to explain why that's just wrong. You, should, you, you shouldn't function that way. It's not, a, it's not an appropriate way to function in an organization. But it does beg you to ask the question. When you're looking at when failures happen, you, have, you start asking these questions. You have to ask the question, is it the person or is it the system that you would want to blame? Right? Is that the reason why it went down? Did the person do it or did the system allow it to happen? Or was it the system or was it the process that was, that was used? You'll recall when AWS uh, or S3 had that brown out, the administrator that was performing the maintenance task didn't do anything wrong. But what happened was the system allowed too many nodes to go into maintenance and, and go into rework and the system failed and the process failed because nobody was checking to see whether, you know, what the constraint or the limitations and the criteria for the system were. So it was a holistic failure, right? It was, it was a result of a complex system having a path that could cause this to happen. So in dealing with failure, as IT professionals, we have to focus on the variables that are in our control. And there are many variables that are in our control. There's a lot of things that we can control that can limit our exposure to failure. First is improve your skills, obviously. Right? The more you practice and the more you work at something, the more awareness you have in the, the complexity of the system, the functioning mechanics of the system, and the less likely you are to trip up and make mistakes. Well, we're human, we're gonna make mistakes, but improving your skills in the, in the work that you do is an obvious, easy thing that you can control. Increasing your knowledge. And this isn't just knowledge about the things that you work on, but Again, those broader systems, you know, your, your system knowledge and the interactions of how these systems work together. More planning, always a good thing, right? You can control that. You can control how much you plan. Doesn't matter if there's a bug, you can't control the bug, okay? Um, improve your relationship with the people that you work with, right? And by doing this, it means that you are setting yourself up to have someone to help you when there is an issue or to help review the work that you're doing. Improve those relationships with the people that can be involved in responding to that failure or avoiding that failure. And then, of course, take care of yourself. I think we've all worked late nights and woke up in the morning and said, whoa, I did that all wrong. That was all bad, right? You're working out of exhaustion. You've been working long weeks. You're tired. You've been on call all week, right? You're more prone to make mistakes in those scenarios. If you're tired, if you're feeling unfit or unwell, you know, that's something that you can control. Right? You can communicate that and deal with that. Another thing that you can do is ask, do I have the information I need to respond or to prevent this? Now, data for most incidents is there. Right? What we're not good at, typically, is asking whether or not we have the data to actually identify that issue before it would happen or be able to respond quickly to that issue when it does happen, right? This is also something that you can control. You also look at your systems and discuss how well your systems are prepared to check for failure. Can your systems look at an overall state of a node in your environment or the behavior of, and response rate of an API, right? And identify that this is probably going potentially cause an outage and have to be addressed. You know, are your systems being built so that they can self-heal 
or be more automated response. Uh, I loved earlier in the talk when we were talking about automation being one of your responders. Absolutely. And that's something that you put into your systems. You look at your people and say, are my the people looking at the systems that we manage and the work that we're doing, um, you look at whether or not they are checking for failure. Because honestly, in all my years in IT operations and all my years working with developers, we don't ever walk in expecting things to break. We just don't. We are reactive to things failing. We're not proactive to eliminating things failing. Our processes, are our, are our processes set up in such a way that we anticipate failure? One of my favorite examples of this is like the chaos engineering, right? That is literally setting up a process to screw with everything that you're working on to help you identify uh, failures and, and, and issues and strengthen the way you respond to it. And then the technology that you use. Does your technology have the flexibility and the capacity or capability for it to be programmatically um, built in order to be better uh, prepared to check for failure and to survive failure and respond to failure? One of my favorites is managing your impact radius. I like talking about impact radius because um, our fear is that we're going to make that one change and it's going to take it all down, right? But the reality is, is that I think there's three stages of failure, right? The first stage is, oh, that's not so bad. I can take care of that. Like, no big deal. I can reverse that. Not a problem. Then there's, oh, golf. And I say golf because golf was named golf because all the other four-letter words were taken. <laughs> right? Like, th this, one's, this one's bad. Like, I'm going to have to get help. Like, this is going to get me in trouble. I feel awful about this. Like, I have messed it up really bad. And then there's, somebody clear my browser history. I'm not going to survive this. Right? The interesting thing is, is it's very seldom we ever experience a true clear my browser history failure. It's very seldom we do. Like you'll do it a couple of times in your career, and if you're doing it more often than that, you have some other systematic problems that you should look at and address. See my previous slides. Okay? Most of the time, these problems are not that bad. And with good, healthy dialogue around failure and good processes and systems in place around how you um, look at failure and manage failure, you'll have more of those, that's not so bad. Okay? Yoda is one of my favorite teachers when it comes to failure because he's like, I'm not going to do the Yoda voice. I'm sorry. It's been a long day. But failure, most of all, the greatest teacher failure is. Right? Nothing can tell you more about your capacity and your limitations, or your against your perceived limitations, like actual failure. And in this, he, he's trying to instill that it's okay that you don't get it right. right. Even with my children, I have to explain to them, when they don't do well at something, it's okay. You're going to get better. Right? They, they understand that frustration very early on. Like, use that as an opportunity to, to learn. My friend Leah Shob, also similar thing. Right? Failure is that golden nugget. It is that thing that really brings to light how you can actually grow. I, I read this really interesting thing. Everyone familiar with the Biodome? Not the movie with Polly Shore, <laughs> but the actual Biodome? I don't know if you're aware of this, but they discovered this interesting phenomenon in the Biodome that they weren't expecting. All of the trees in the Biodome were extremely brittle. <laughs> They just fall apart. Anybody guess why? No wind. They did not have any resistance. So there was nothing forcing them to strengthen. Right? Just like with our muscles when we exercise and work out, like my legs right now after the run this morning, right? That that resistance, right? That that going towards, you know, just close to failure makes us stronger. All right. Another thing I think is really, really important because I've told you all these things that you have in your control, if you utilize those things that are in your control, you become a very, you're a contagion, right? You become very contagious, right? People see the way that you respond to failure and realize I can adopt that methodology for responding to failure as well. So first and foremost, demonstrate that it's okay to accept that complex systems are going to fail. 
they're just going to fail. What's important is how you respond to that failure. Lead by example when you have to respond to failure. Um, one of the things that I always found interesting when I was on call, um, especially in the larger organizations I was in, I was called on to the call all the time, and I never at first could not understand why people always brought me onto the call. Well, I found out there were two reasons. Number one, I had the broadest context because I was a virtualization engineer. I saw more of the world. I understood more of the complexity of the systems, and I could root cause faster. Well, I got tired of being that guy, so I gave everybody access to view so they could see what was happening. They're like, you can see that the Nick's down. I don't need to be on there to tell you. That helped out a lot. I got paged a lot less. But then I realized that people would bring me on because I had a very calm, methodical response to how we were going to respond to failure. I was very quick to shut people down who wanted to point fingers or to um, directly say, there's no way it's us. We had a major outage with a payroll system one time. And I, they bring me on and say, OK, what happened? What's going on? Uh, well, this, the payroll's not running. It usually finishes in three hours. We're six hours in, and we're only 15% through. Okay, great. What's changed? Nothing. <laughs> so the second question is like, okay, is this going over the wire or is it local? It's local. I'm like, all right, so it's not the network's fault this time. All right, network team's happy. Um, uh, but the net result is something had changed. They had added in a million uh, row table and didn't index it. Thanks, DBAs. That's okay. We still love DBAs. We need them. The other thing that you can do to kind of lead is create safe to fail environments. Um, I'm going to talk more about this one in a minute. I should have made it to my fourth bullet. Okay? And then blameless postmortems. Right? We talk about it ad nauseum in the industry, and we should. It's so important in how we look at the way things failed. Again, look at that top number or that top bullet, and look at the bottom bullet. Those two are inextricably tied. Okay, let me tell you about Tom. So Tom was a guy on my, uh, on my team and a junior system administrator, fresh out of college, excited to be working at this small engineering firm. Um, I was going to use a different name to protect the innocent, but I, I would just end up saying Tom in the end, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it. In this scenario, our business, uh, our business needed us to upgrade our Active Directory domain from 2000 to 2003 because we needed to go to the new exchange server. 2007, I think it was. We were a bit behind, small engineering firm, right? Um, not a trivial thing, as I hope a lot of y'all are aware. Um, but we gave a long window for the project. I gave uh, Tom total control on the project, had him do all the due diligence, all the dependencies, uh, mapping on what would happen in the change, um, fail over or fail back if, if we ran into an issue, what's our plan there? Had him present to our IT leader uh, so that he was on board and knew what was going on. I, I forced him to take this entire project on himself. And I walked along the way with him. We get to the night where we're making the change. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna upgrade uh, DC Promo. We're going to upgrade the Active Directory controller, right? And everything's staged up, ready to go. All he's got to do is hit enter, and he stops. I lean over and I'm like, need to make a trip to the bathroom? Because in that moment, I knew he understand, understood the full ramification of what was about to happen. This was either going to be the greatest night of his professional career or the story he would talk about for the rest of his life. And instead, I'm talking about it. Um, <laughs> but what I told him was like, Tom, you have done everything that we could possibly do to prepare for this. You know what's going to happen. You know what our plan is. I'm here. Let's do it. He took a deep breath, hit enter. End of the story, everything went fine. We had a couple little bumps with some accounts that didn't like the transition. Nothing major. It worked fine. What worked here, and, and, I, and the example I think that we should all set with the people we work with, is I gave him the time and space that he needed to fully actually legitimately prepare for this high impactful change. Okay. I also made sure that he was prepared for the worst case. How are we going to respond if this fails? How are we going to maintain business continuity tomorrow if our Active Directory server and email is out? What are we going to do? How are we going to communicate with our customers? How are we going to communicate with one another? Right? We had plans for that. They weren't great plans, but they were plans. 
most importantly, I made sure that I supported him no matter what the outcome was. Right? He was not doing this change 10 o'clock at night by himself. I was right there with him. And because of that, we were in a safe environment to get this work done. If we failed, fine, we're going to respond, we're going to jump all in together, and we're going to make, fix it and make it right. This quote is attributed to Winston Churchill, and everybody says it's not him. But success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. It is very, very, very difficult to maintain high enthusiasm in an industry where failure is so common and so poorly accepted. It's very difficult. We must as engineers and developers and IT operations people, we must change the way that we communicate and the way that we work with one another around failure. We have to improve it. Because if we lose the enthusiasm of everybody, we don't get to have events like this. And everybody's just really not enjoying working. Thomas Edison is a, is a notable failure. Uh, if you know anything about his story with the light bulb, 10,000 times he found out how not to make a light bulb. That's a hell of perspective around failure. Right? But he's absolutely right. And he also makes the point that most people will give up right before they're about to, like, to succeed. And if you watch HBO's Ballers, Spencer Strassmore says, if you want to be endlessly motivated, failure is key. The way that we grow and become stronger professionals and stronger people the way that we become stronger trees is through resistance and failure. Right? It is how we get better. And we've, we do have some fun with failure. Right? Companies have gotten really good with their 404s. Um, but um, you know, if, if I can get anything for you to take away and to take home from here, you know, make failure a positive force in your life. Right? Become comfortable talking about failure. Make it safe. To, be, to fail in the environments and the, and, the, and the groups that you're within. Demonstrate that leadership, that failure is okay, it happens, nobody's by themselves, nobody's gonna get their head cut off, I mean, not literally, but like figuratively, right? Everything's gonna be fine. And help others when they fail. How you respond to other people when they fail, okay? And most importantly, don't quit, right? Don't let a, don't let a failure stop you. Right? You're, you know, like they said, you're, you're just right around the corner. Interestingly enough, right outside of the door, right around the corner here, if you commit to something and stay the course, anything's possible. Right? Success is a result of consistent failure and how you respond to that failure. So how many of you, when you leave here today, are going to go out and fail? Thank you.